There's an epic saying in Italy when it comes to family businesses. The first generation creates, the second generation expands, and the third generation destroys. That's almost what happened in the story of Gucci, except that the third generation not only destroyed their family legacy, but they also lied, cheated, and even murdered. And then they sold their company to Middle Eastern investors just to get back at each other. And that's not even half the story. Started by a bellhop in Florence, Italy, and valued today at $17 billion, but the question still remains. How did the House of Gucci survive all of the internal feuds, bankruptcies, and hostile takeovers, and still manage to become the billion dollar luxury brand that it is today? This is the true story of the House of Gucci, and it began over a century ago. Guccio Gucci, the founder of the legendary luxury brand, was born in Florence, Italy in 1881 to a family of a long line of merchants. And by the time he was 17, he was already on his own venturing abroad when he arrived in London to the world's most extravagant scene, the Hotel Savoy. He was there to work as a dishwasher, but later on he would be promoted to a bellhop, then a waiter and an elevator attendant. The Savoy was considered the place to be at the time, since the hotel had the first electric elevator on the planet, therefore received the most distinguished guests from all around Europe. This gave the young Guccio the rarest opportunity to observe wealthy people and their habits up close and personal. He noticed that almost all of them traveled with exquisite handbags and luggage that were more than practical. They were symbols of their status. He also had a chance to observe their taste in terms of quality, fabrics, and style. He noticed that the wealthy were obsessed with the idea of exclusivity, and they cared very little about the cost. In 1921, Guccio finally saved enough money to return to Florence and open up his own store. His store was called Valigeria Guccio Gucci, which later he would shorten it to only Gucci. In it, he sold leather handbags and luggage that he himself handpicked from suppliers in Tuscany, Germany, and England. At the same time, he opened a small workshop next door and started to manufacture his own leather goods made by his local craftsmen. But as this business grew over the next decade, in 1939, World War II was about to break, and several nations suddenly imposed harsh sanctions on Italy, and Guccio could no longer supply the leather that he needed. But this development did not discourage Guccio, instead only pushed him to introduce other fabrics into his design. So Guccio started to use new textures like raffia, wicker, wood, linen, jute, and coincidentally, out of this necessity, the Rombi motif, which would later be Gucci's main signature, was also created in this era. By the early 50s, after the end of World War II, Guccio's sons Aldo and Rodolfo were all grown up and they were looking for ways to make an impact on family business. So they were secretly trying to find ways to expand to America and open up a store in New York. And their constant efforts to convince their cautious father Guccio finally succeeded in 1953, and Gucci opened its first US store on Fifth Avenue and 58th Street in New York. And royals and celebrities became instant fans. In just a short period of six months, Gucci's most loyal customers included Queen Elizabeth, Princess Grace of Monaco, Jackie Kennedy, Sophia Loren, Elizabeth Taylor, and many, many more. Soon it was very clear that New York was just the beginning of a worldwide expansion, and that the Gucci family had much to celebrate. But the same year in 1953, when all the celebrations were in order, Guccio suddenly passed away of a heart attack and left his legacy in the hands of his sons Aldo and Rodolfo. And once the major force that was holding everything together was gone, it was the beginning of the demise. Remember the famous saying, the first generation creates, the second expands, and the third destroys? That's the story of Gucci in a nutshell. The tale started with the founder Guccio, who had a simple vision for making leather goods and selling them to wealthy Europeans. Then came his two sons Aldo and Rodolfo, who each ended up having 50% of the company and expanded the business, and even increased its revenue 25 times over a decade after Guccio was gone. And even though the brand of Gucci was thriving, and they were all making so much money, enough for everyone, now that the third generation of new Guccis were growing up, they, like their parents before them, wanted to rush in and make their mark in the family business. So now on one side, the sons of Aldo Gucci, there were Giorgio, Paolo and Roberto, and on the other, it was the only heir of Rodolfo, Maurizio, and they all began to stray from their family commitments and started to rebel in their own way. For instance, Giorgio secretly opened his own Gucci shop without telling anyone or having an official approval from the company. His brother Paolo, frustrated by his father, started his own label and became a rival to his own name. He even at some point became an informant to rat on his own father to the IRS, 
because he knew that Aldo was hiding money and putting it in offshore accounts. But the major turning point came in 1983 when Rodolfo Gucci died and left his 50% stake in the company to his only son, Maurizio. Maurizio was the silent one in the family, but in fact he was simply waiting in the shadows to implement his unique vision for Gucci's future. And now it was his time to make a move. Maurizio soon realized that the only way to implement his ideas was to buy the entire family out of the company, but he didn't have the money to do that, so he needed investors. So, he made a deal with a private investment firm called InvestCorps and offered them a partnership with the single condition that if they could manage to buy the 50% stakes of the company off his family, they would be in Gucci business together. And from then on, InvestCorps went on to work. They used the feud between Paulo and his father and offered him 10 times the value of his small but very strategic 3% shares of the company to sell. And once Paulo accepted the offer, from then on, InvestCorps and Maurizio owned the majority of Gucci, and the move eventually left no choice but for the other brothers to sell their shares as well. 50% of all the available shares of Gucci were ultimately purchased by InvestCorps. If you like the story so far and want to hear more from us, like this video, subscribe, and turn on the notification bell. So as Maurizio emerged as the new CEO of Gucci, thanks to his agreement with InvestCorps, he now held the total management control of the company as well, and now it was time to implement his vision. At this point, even though mostly thanks to his beloved uncle Aldo, who was in prison at the time for tax evasion, Gucci had expanded into very crucial locations like Japan and Hong Kong, and for many its reputation and name recognition was pretty much intact. But the reality was that the brand value of Gucci was deteriorating. They were doing too much in too many places, therefore the exclusivity of the brand was slipping away. So Maurizio wanted to size down immediately and clean up the Gucci brand, and overnight he closed down the entire Gucci accessories branch. At the time, the decision created shock in the company since Gucci accessories was the most lucrative part of their business, generating more than 70% of their annual sales. Everybody, including his new partners, were speechless. And although it may seem like a good decision at the time, in its very sudden aftermath, Gucci went on a tailspin and started losing some real money, even up to a point when over a year later they were not even able to pay their salaries nor their suppliers. Gucci was suddenly on the verge of declaring bankruptcy, and InvestCorps, now extremely worried and in this partnership for millions and millions of dollars, immediately created a war room and decided to go after Maurizio with everything they could. They had to get him out. And in a period of three short months of full pressure, they finally convinced Maurizio to sell his 50% share back to InvestCorp. It was now official. There was no longer a Gucci in the Gucci business. But the misfortunes of the house of Gucci were not yet fully over and it was just about to get worse. In 1995, when Maurizio was standing in front of his new office building in Milano, Italy, he was shot at point blank by a gunman and was killed in broad daylight. And although this was a targeted execution, the prosecutor, after spending almost a year investigating and looking into his business and family conflicts, could not establish a clear motive or suspect for the murder. Two years later, an anonymous tip revived the investigation. And in a shocking twist, the tip revealed that it was his ex-wife, Patrizia Reggiani, who hired the hitman to kill her ex-husband Maurizio after he forced her for a divorce and married another woman who even was a friend of hers. Patrizia soon admitted her part in the murder and said that she felt humiliated and started to obsess about Maurizio's death after the event of their divorce. In 1998, she was sentenced to 29 years in prison for arranging the killing of Maurizio Gucci, and with good behavior she was released in 2016. Maurizio's death was the perfect symbol for the end of an era, the end of the family legacy in the Gucci company. And now, it was time for the Gucci brand to take on in a different direction, and for that, they needed somebody with fresh eyes and fresh vision. InvestCorps was very quick to pick Domenico De Sol as their new CEO. Domenico was a longtime trustee of the company and the current CEO of Gucci America since 1984, and his first order of business was to create the direction for a new Gucci. So, he partnered up with visionary Tom Ford as their new creative director. Carrying on Gucci's legacy was now left to Domenico and Tom together. This period would later be known as the Tom Dom era of Gucci, and it was truly a sight to see. The immediate change in the direction of their company was clear from their very first show in Florence. There was a new Gucci in town. 
Tom was redefining Gucci for the entire generation. And even though he was introducing new and very sexy styles on the runway, he was also combining it with primarily simple black and brown handbags, and the energy of his design lines were carrying the fire of the new Gucci brand. It was almost a fashion revolution, and sales took off immediately. And at that point, InvestCorps wanted to use this positive comeback energy to go public as fast as possible. The Gucci IPO was going to be the first one ever of a fashion brand to go public, and it was massive. It was even more successful than anybody's wildest dreams, and it ended up making more than $2 billion for InvestCorps. But the spotlight of this huge success also suddenly made the company a target for everyone, including corporate raiders for a hostile takeover. At the time, in the market of high-end fashion, the true rival of Gucci was Louis Vuitton Moet Hennessy, or LVMH. So when the economic crisis hit Asia in 1997, LVMH started to buy Gucci stocks at its lowest price ever, and Domenico de Sol realized that he was looking to a fight for Gucci's future. So, Domenico pulled in bankers and advisors and staged a resistance with the main concern of stopping LVMH being able to take over Gucci without offering a full and fair offer to all of its shareholders. But with the crisis in Asia still ongoing, at a certain point, even Domenico realized that he wasn't going to be able to defend forever. And at that moment, Francois Pinault, the founder of another luxury group, Karine, who owned Yves Saint Laurent at the time, came in and offered to buy the majority stakes of Gucci. The new boss asked for one thing in return, for Gucci to take on a new mission to become the leader of the fashion industry. And with it, he turned Yves Saint Laurent and $3 billion over to Tom and Dom and gave them the task of creating a fashion empire to build the house of Gucci. And they were up for it. So now, both of them were not only responsible for creating two major catalogs for two major brands, such as Gucci and Yves Saint Laurent, but now they were also tasked with buying up more brands and expanding. And they did just that, in an unprecedented way. Soon, Gucci bought Alexander McQueen, Stella McCartney, and they even bought and revived an old brand, Balenciaga. And in just five years, as promised, Gucci was a fashion empire. And from then on, their success would only go higher and higher. And what made Gucci so successful, especially in the Tom Dom era, was always about how they would reinvent themselves at each step and reinvent the sex of its generation over and over again. The level of partnership between Tom Ford and Domenico Di Sol played a huge role. And with this new synergy between the creative director and the management of fashion houses, it suddenly became an essential component that every brand tried to find. In 2004, when their contracts were up with Gucci, Tom and Dom decided to leave the company and paved the way for the new generation of Gucci designers and their executives to come into place. And first with the leadership of Frida Giannini, and then with Alessandro Michel, Gucci phenomenally and successfully redefined sex and fashion over and over again in a rather unprecedented way. Today, Gucci is worth over $17 billion and it has over a thousand directly operated stores worldwide. It's always interesting to witness the incredible story of a young bellhop starting a humble company overseas and in just over a century of time, through so many people, watch it transform into something so different beyond anyone's imagination. And with each touch along the way, with each visionary it kept on transforming into the billion dollar luxury brand, the house of Gucci as we know it today. And as the Gucci brand feeds the future generation's view of fashion, culture, sex, and art, today they tell us the tale of a more gender-blending, non-binary sex, and their story has really resonated with millennials and people under 35, which has always been very challenging to attract for the luxury brands. But some brands simply have the magic, don't they? And this is the story of the House of Gucci to survive against all odds.